Tony Robbins used to describe NLP as the science of how language affects our neurology. And while that is not completely accurate, there's some truth in there. In today's episode, I will address how the way we talk to ourselves and the words we choose can determine whether we succeed or fail. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. Hello there, everyone. This is Doug O'Brien talking with you again from my porch. <laughs> I, am, I am outside. It's 30 degrees out here, but it's sunny. And uh, well, that's the only thing it is besides cold. It's sunny. It's not too snowy or cold or rainy or things. It's just uh, kind of a light breeze. You can hear the wind chimes hanging from the old maple tree back there, making a fuss. So uh, that's what that is. If you hear those little bells ringing, it's the wind. So I'm talking to you today about language. Today's episode is going to be about language. Now, many of you are aware that I am a student or trainer, both of Neuro Linguistic Programming, also known as NLP. Neurolinguistic programming, we like to say language is our middle name. Yeah, so NLP joke. But seriously now, folks, the way you talk to yourself, and of course, the way you talk to others, and uh, the way you interact with your coach clients, if you are a coach, or however it is that you might be using language, has an effect, doesn't it? The way you talk to yourself has an effect. And so one of the things I want to be talking to you about today is an aspect of the field of neuro-linguistic programming called modal operators of necessity or possibility. This modal operators of necessity or possibility. If you want to know what modal operators, where the word comes modal operators, you'd have to look that up. I, I honestly don't know. It's, it's from the world of logic. Um, that much I know. But I can give you plenty of examples of what they are. The modal operators, if you say to, to yourself, say to yourself something like, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that. Or I must do that. Or I want to do that. Those ways of describing those adjectives of, I guess they're adjectives, those ways of describing um, the thing. I want to, I have to, I can, I can't. Those are modal operators. And what's interesting about them is that they really pack a punch. They are very small little bits of language, but they, they do a lot. My original teacher of NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, was Tony Robbins back in the 1980s. And um, he used to have a T-shirt. They had lots of T-shirts, but he sold T-shirts, um, <laughs> lots and lots of T-shirts. And they had a, a phrase on them. The phrase was this. It was a modal operator chain chain of motor operators, it said this, if you can't, you must. And if you must, you will. So one motor operator, I can't. Shifting to I must. Shifting to I will. So if you can't, then you must. That means you will. It's kind of a structure of a belief system. It's a kind of nifty little phrase. Because a lot of times people will say to themselves things like, oh, I can't do that. And if so, the idea is if you hear yourself saying that, then, okay, now you've got to. And now, now you must. And if you must, then that's a modal operator of necessity. Then, therefore, you will. Now, what's interesting about that phrase is because it was anchored into us so much back in those days, it was just kind of repeated over and over again. If you can't, you must. If you must, you will. Yeah. You know, Tony Robbins stuff. Um that it became somewhat effective, you know? So if you heard yourself saying something like, oh, I, I, I really can't ask for a raise. It's like, oh, geez, now I must. Okay, boss, I need a raise. You know, you, you do it. It became anchored in. But what's also interesting to me is that um, I never personally 
got that much charge out of that that phrase i must the word must didn't really mean much to me and one of the things i have recognized is that people are different everybody's different you're different aren't you i mean from what i can tell you're different i don't even know who you are but somebody whoever you are listening to this you're certainly different from me i mean right aren't you Everybody's different. Of course they are. Everyone's unique. Milton Erickson used to say everyone is as individual as their own thumbprint. Right? Everybody's different. So what works for you is the question. What I discovered for myself is the word must didn't really do much for me, didn't get me totally motivated. But the phrase I have to did. If I said to myself, I have to do that, well, guess what? I would be doing it very soon. I'd do it then. I'd do it the next day. I, it, would, it would happen. It would get done. Right? And those are kind of interesting phrases too, aren't they? It would happen. It would get done. So you can talk to yourself that way. It's important, I believe, to find your own personal motivational triggers. You know, what motivates you? I might have told you this story before. I'm going to tell you a story again anyway. It has to do with a very famous playwright. Uh, he's dead, but he's famous anyway. Um, his name is Henrik Ibsen, a Norwegian playwright. And I don't know if you know this about Henrik Ibsen or not, but he is the most produced playwright in history after Shakespeare. So Shakespeare plays were done more than anything else in the world historically, and then Henrik Ibsen is second. That's a lot of plays. You're probably familiar with some of them. Had a gabbler as an example. Uh, there's there's lots of wonderful Ibsen plays. A few years ago, my wife and I went to Oslo, Norway. She was there for a uh, seminar that she was going to be participating in. So I, I tagged along. I'd never been there before. And we'd rarely traveled together. So we figured, hey, let's do it. And I did go along with her. And it was a wonderful thing. One of the things we did there is we visited the Henrik Ibsen Museum. My, my wife is an actress and actor and teaches acting and things like that. So we went to visit this Henrik Ibsen Museum. Now the museum was or is where he lived. It was his apartment. It's where he lived in Oslo. So it's an apartment. It's very interesting. It's a place. My, my friend Ulf Sandstrom in Stockholm has an apartment. It's very similar. <laughs> built the you know, same year kind of thing, very similar layout, just an, an apartment. But it was fascinating because it was kept in exactly the same condition it was when he lived there. He was well off. He was a very successful playwright even in his day. So it was very nice. But it was old at this point, right? So these are kind of antiques, but those were his actual tables and chairs and things like that. Now, the reason I'm telling you this story, it's not much of a story, I'll admit, but the reason I'm telling you this anecdote is that in his writing room, the whole the whole apartment you can walk around in, you know, you can go whatever room you want to, except his workroom, his office. You can't go in there. That's that's plexiglassed off. So you can look into it from the door, but you can't go in. But I did take a picture of the place, and I will tell you my photograph, if I showed it to you, is a picture of a room that's dominated by this portrait, this large six foot high painting that Henrik Ibsen had commissioned of a guy named August Strindberg. Now, if you are a theater buff, you know August Strindberg is another playwright. He is a contemporary of, of Ibsen's. He was Swedish, a Swedish playwright. And um, I don't know where he ranks in the most produced plays in the world, but he's probably up there as well. Strindberg's written a lot of good stuff. So August Strindberg's up on Henrik Ibsen's wall. And this is from those days that Henrik Ibsen had this portrait commissioned and he hung it on his wall. Now what's weird about this, it wasn't a admiration. It wasn't because he, he liked the guy. In fact, quite the opposite. You know, you might expect to have a picture of your kids or your wife or your husband or whatever on your desk. This was not like that. This was his mortal enemy. They were, that's the exact phrase they used, although I'm not sure what it is in Norwegian, but translated, it is my mortal enemy. They hated each other. 
hated each other. They would write scathing reviews about each other's plays when they came out. It's like, that guy can't write. You know, it's just terrible, terrible stuff. If it was, you know, Facebook or Instagram, you'd just be flaming, you know, just horrible, horrible stuff. Why would you think he'd have a portrait of his mortal enemy commissioned, six foot high thing, you know, real life size in his working room? Well, of course, as you probably have figured out already, it's because it motivated him. It motivated him. He looked at that and was like, gosh, darn you, or whatever stronger language is than that in Norwegian. You know, gosh, darn you, Strindberg, I'll show you I can write better plays than you can. Right? It's that kind of motivation. He knew what made him tick. He knew what he made himself be motivated. And he made sure that he was. Every day, every day, he would get to his writing desk at nine o'clock. At least that's what it said in the museum. Um, helped by his wife, it also said in the museum. And then at 1130, when that big grandfather clock in his office struck 1130, bong, he would put down his writing pen in the middle of a sentence, in the middle of a word, it said in the museum. And, and he would walk downtown to the uh, Grand Hotel and have lunch there. He had a table reserved for himself every single day. He'd walk there and sit in that table. No one was supposed to talk to him. He was there to observe people so he could get inspiration for his characters. Interesting. I wonder if people saw themselves in the plays afterwards. Anyway, the reason he put his pen down in the middle of a word, he said, well, if I finish the sentence or I finish the paragraph, then I would be coming back to a blank page. But because I put the pen down in the middle of a sentence or in the middle of a word, I know exactly where to pick up and just keep going when I come back from lunch. But he did this every day with this portrait of his mortal enemy staring over his shoulder. I find this an inspiring story. I find this really inspirational because why? It shows that it doesn't have to be, you know, roses and chocolates and never you know puppy dogs tails and stuff it's like it doesn't have to be like oh gosh i'm i'm feeling so good i want to write my play now you can be motivated for many reasons find what works for you find what your motivation is what your phrase is if it is something like if you can't you must then make your own t-shirts you know put that get a tattoo on your on your wrist you know have it be there something you see all the time you know do it find what motivates you find the language that motivates you so all of these modal operators of necessity and possibility there's a whole slew of them but i'm sure you're aware of most of them and i'm just going to ask you to do this just to try it on for size i want you to think of something think of something that you you know are motivated to do but perhaps you haven't quite done yet like maybe write a play like Strindberg or write a book or whatever it might be think of something design that website to get your coaching business going whatever it might be think of that thing that you want to do picture it in your mind right now go ahead and then say to yourself I should do that I should do that and just notice, how does it make you feel? Does it make you feel like, okay, let's go. I'm doing it. It's, it's, it's going to get done. If that's true, then great. Should is your word. For most people, I would venture to say should is not that kind of word. I should do it. I will do it eventually, maybe, probably. I should, really should, but eh, see what happens. Now try this one out for size. Forget that. Picture the thing that you want to accomplish. Picture it in your mind. And now say this to yourself. I must do that. I must do that. How does that feel? Must. I must do that. Notice. If it's great, then it's great. Do it. How about this? Close your eyes. Picture that thing in your mind. Say this to yourself. I have to do that. Now, if you're like me, that might make you get up and start doing it right now, turn off the podcast, get going. Right? Might do or not. Maybe you've got a part of your brain that goes, I don't have to do anything. You can't tell me what to do. You're not the boss of me. 
I don't know. You're different. So what is it for you? What if you try this one on for size? Say this. I will do that. Now picture that in your mind and say, I'm going to do that. And picture it in your mind and say, I'm doing it. Picture it in your mind and say, it's done. How's that feel? How's that feel? Find what works for you. And then also notice that the way you say what you're saying to yourself also has a huge impact, doesn't it? If you said to yourself, I will do that, versus I will do that, it's different, isn't it? Say, I, I must do that. I must do that. I have to do that. I have to do that. I have to do that. Lots of different ways you can say it, and it's different. So also notice that, won't you? Notice how you're saying what you're saying. Notice what you're going to say, and then say it in the way that really, really works. Now, one of the things some of you know, if you've studied any, any, any NLP, is that we're often told by the NLPers, trainers like me, is that communication can be broken down into three segments. What you say, the words, the tonality of how you say it, and then also the third component is your body language when you say it. So now this is an audio podcast, so you can't see me right now. But if you can imagine me like, you know, kind of frowning and shaking my head, you know, the kind of a grimace on my face and say, yes, dear, I'm really happy that your in-laws, my in-laws, your parents are coming to visit. Right. If you can imagine my shaking my head with a grimace on my face saying, I'm really happy that my, my in-laws are coming to visit, you might gather that perhaps I'm not really that excited about the in-laws coming over. Right. The, because the body language would be very, very different, incongruent with what I'm saying. So, in fact, you might realize that it's exactly the opposite even though the words, if they're printed on a page or printed on a Hallmark card or something, might look just fine, real nice. But when you see and hear how I say it, be very, very different, right? So it may, in fact, be really critical to not only say the right words, but say them in the right way and say them with the right intensity of body language. Say it with conviction in your body, how would you say it if you really, really meant it now? You know? used to do this exercise with students in classes where I'd talk about all this, and then I'd say, okay, think about that thing that you want to do, and then say to yourself, I am absolutely 100% completely certain that I will do it. And I wrote that on the board so they could, you know, get the words exactly right. And then... I asked them to think of the thing they wanted to do, like you've been doing, and then say that phrase to themselves. But they'd say it like this. I am absolutely 100% convinced and dedicated to getting that done. I forgot the phrase already. Short-term memory loss. It's a terrible thing. But, you know, they'd say it with a tonality that just was totally incongruent with the message. Uh, and everybody kind of laughed. It was funny. It's obviously what I was getting across. That the tonality was much more important than the words. Even though the words were great, I am absolutely 100% completely convinced that I will do it. Didn't come out that way. So then gradually we got more and more of the congruence in. Until finally, not only were they like shouting it out and saying it with conviction, but they were standing up on their feet, you know, and, and raising their fist over their head like, Mighty Mouse, and I am absolutely do, 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 convinced I will do it. Do, 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 do. Here I come to save the day. Um, Mighty Mouse, anybody? Mighty Mouse, anybody? No, probably not. Well, it's an old reference, but you know what I'm talking about, that kind of superhero posture. Here I come to save the day. You can imagine it or Google it. It's probably there somewhere. Anyway, then 
while they were suddenly going like, okay, now I understand. Then I'd say, well, yeah. So it's really that 93% of tonality and the physiology that's most important. Almost as if that 7% of the word choices didn't matter at all. But then I threw him a curve and I changed the word choices, that little 7% by just a couple of letters. I put an N apostrophe T. So it was now, I am absolutely 100% completely certain that I can't do it. And to tell you the truth, it didn't matter how congruent their tonality was or their physiology was because that little 7% had that in there. I can't do it. That wasn't good. So it's all three, isn't it? You need to know what the words are that anchor you into a place of motivation, anchor you into a place where like, yeah, I'm going to do this. It's done. To also having the tonality and also having the physiology to get yourself going. Now, because this podcast is about essential coaching skills, this awareness of language, the awareness of the power of language is something that's not only true for you, but also true for your clients. So you want to notice what they're saying to themselves. You know, what's stopping them from accomplishing what it is that they want to accomplish in their lives? Maybe it's this. Maybe they're just talking to themselves ineffectively. Maybe they're taking a seminar from somebody as wonderful and dramatic and you know, positive as Tony Robbins and thinking, I got to be like that. But that's not who they are. What they need to do is find what motivates them. And what you can do as a coach is to help them find those words, right? And you do it just something like this, trial and error. You know, you try on different ones and see what works, see what makes you go. It's also true that we as coaches have to basically mind our own store. We've got to do it for ourselves. We've got to create the business, create the podcast, create the websites, create the whatever it is that's going to help have a a business model of our own. And sometimes that's kind of daunting. Sometimes that's kind of hard, you know, to pick yourself up by the bootstraps, if you will. Have you ever tried pulling yourself up by the bootstraps? It's not really effective. It really, I don't even know where that came from. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can pull your boots up by your bootstraps and pull yourself up. It's not very effective. It's, it's really, trust me, it's, um, I actually am wearing boots at the moment because it's, I mentioned cold outside. So <laughs> I'm dressed appropriately. It's kind of uh, 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 silly. To, <laughs> I'm really, I'm dressed for skiing, skiing right now and I'm sitting on my, my back porch. It's gotten a little less windy though. I probably haven't heard too many of those wind chimes since I've been talking, have you? They were really going a while ago. But yeah, pulling yourself up by the bootstraps, not really true. And you know what I'm talking about. We, we need to do that for ourselves as entrepreneurs, as perhaps solopreneurs. You know, we've got to wear a lot of hats. We've got to do a lot of different things. You have to be great coaches and great business people, don't you? I mean, you've got to do all that stuff. You've got to do your own marketing. you got to, you know, do all stuff and hire people, don't you? You have to hire people who can help you if you can't do it yourself. Just as an example of that, um, a lot of people in the NLP world that I, I know personally, at least, are, are very smart people. Uh, like my friend Jonathan Altfeld, as an example, you might have heard his podcast, his my interview with him on this podcast um, a few episodes ago. Jonathan's a really smart guy and uh, really knows computers. And neurolinguistic programming comes from the world of computing. It looks at the brain as if it's like a computer. So therefore we can program the computer. If you understand the language, the neuro language, the neuro linguistics, right? The computer language of our brain. If you can really understand the computer language, then you can program that computer. That's kind of the whole basis behind it. So some of the guys, some of the guys in uh, NLP are 
like that. They're computer programmers and they really know their stuff. I'm not, I'm a musician, but I thought, gosh, you know, I, I can model them. I can become good at stuff. I can design my own websites. I can learn, learn HTML. This was a few years ago. And, and I did, I took classes and designed my own website. It was pretty good. It's not bad. And, and yeah, I was very proud of having created it, but um, I was running into some snags and I couldn't get the uh, online store working. And, and it's kind of the point to having a, a website is to have it be marketable. So uh, I needed that online store. I'm sure you can appreciate that. And it just wasn't working. So I called the teacher in the, from the class that I was taking. It was this computer school that I had gone to and said, hey, uh, can I hire you to help me fix this thing? And he said, well, sure, but I'm booked up for a couple of weeks. Um, and so I said, okay, well, I'll book it for two weeks and I'll just put me down. And so two weeks later, I had, I had worked for hours trying to get it done before I had to pay him the, the 200 bucks or whatever it was for the hour, but um, still wasn't working. So I, I made the, kept the appointment, went to his place and brought my computer with me and the laptop. And it took him about 20 minutes. Took him about 20 minutes and it was completely done. And then um, not only was it working, but it was like really much better than I had designed it in the first place. It was really good. And then I said, well, how about this? Can I change this? And what about that? So with the remaining 40 minutes after he'd fixed what I'd hired him to do, because we had an hour uh, booking, he like <laughs> made the whole darn thing vastly better than it had been in the first place. And I, and I, and I realized what the heck am I doing? Why am, why am I spending all this time trying to create my own website when I can hire him to do it and he'll do it in, in an hour uh, better than I would have been if I did it for weeks. So I don't design my own websites anymore. I, I hire people to do it. It's, it's really much better. I, I, I am versed enough i'm good enough at um, computers that i can you know update them and things like that i can add content etc but uh, as far as the overall design and the coding and all that stuff goes it's like yeah they'll do that just fine same thing with taxes you know i i add up all the receipts and stuff but i i hire a guy i learned that one exactly the same way years ago i i, I was working as a musician i had no money the I don't know if you know that, but that's pretty much always the case. <laughs> Musicians don't have money, um, except for the you know the few people that we've all heard of collectively. But even them, a lot of times, don't have money either. So I was, uh, you know, living in a basement, <laughs> musician teaching lessons, etc., and and had no money, and uh, came to paying taxes, and and I did my taxes, and I added it all up, and hit the little enter button and that said I owed them like 500 bucks. I'm going like, w I don't, what, how, what, how can that be? I don't have 500 bucks. And so I, um, I went to a guy and it, this was like the 1980s sometime. I went to this guy and it's probably $125 or something, which was a lot of money in those days. But um, I hired him to do it and he found me <laughs> $500 to get back rather than have to pay. So definitely worth it and of course i have never done my taxes since then there are very good things that you can do yourself and should do yourself and then there are other things you should totally hire other people to do because that's much more effective and as entrepreneurs as solopreneurs perhaps you know we have a lot of things to get motivated about in the way that we talk to ourselves our brain listens. You know, that's the one of the things about your conscious and unconscious mind connection is that the way you talk to yourself, your brain listens to you. I sometimes have said to people when I've done, you know, large seminars for smoking cessation or weight loss, you know, I tell people, say, you know, you're very fortunate. I tell this crowd of 100 people or 300 people, whatever, I said, you're very fortunate that you came to the seminar today and were introduced to the greatest hypnotist in the world. And they kind of chuckle a little bit thinking I'm talking about me. And then I say, and that person is sitting right in your chair, sitting right there behind your belly button. 
because, you know, I'm leaving town in just a few hours, but you're staying here with you. And the way you talk to yourself, your brain listens to yourself. So you are the greatest hypnotist in the world for you. So talk good. Talk good to yourself. Talk gooder. Make it even better. Right? Talk pretty to yourself. I think it's a David Sedaris book. Talk pretty. Me talk pretty someday. I'm not sure in the tank. It's something like that. You can Google it. But talk well. Talk good. Talk properly. Talk motivationally to yourself. Talk to yourself in the way that you really mean it. And get going. I'll talk to you in future podcasts about other aspects of language and other aspects of neuro linguistic programming. In fact, I will tell you that one of the things that I am working on with uh, classes that I'm teaching is a thing called the meta model. Meta model is an aspect of neuro linguistic programming that seeks to get more information from a person because all of language, every time you say any sentence at all, there'll be things that are left out. In NLP, we call them deletions, things that we delete, don't put into the communication. If I said something to you like, it's great, you wouldn't know what I'm talking about. You know how I feel about it, but you don't know what it is, right? It, that subject has been left out. We call it deleted. We can also have distortions and generalizations, right? So the meta model is NLP's approach to asking questions to retrieve that lost information. Like, what's great? Who's great? In what way is it great? You can ask questions. The meta model is, in fact, one of those things that made me, in fact, start thinking about this idea of what are essential coaching skills? I was wondering how people can do coaching without knowing the meta model. It's so essential. It's so basic, you know, without that, how can you be a coach? I wondered to myself. So we will be talking about that and other things in future episodes, but I hope this works for you today and start talking to yourself in a good way. Find out what motivates you and do that. If you want to get a painting of somebody painted and put it in your office, then do that. I'll tell you a, a, a quick little story without mentioning any names. But um, for a while after having visited Henrik Ibsen's office, I, I had a picture. I had taken the picture with my camera, my phone uh, in his office and, and had printed it out and put it up on my wall to remind myself of you know motivation. But tell you the truth, it reminded me of the story, but it didn't much motivate me because I, I don't care about Henrik Ibsen or August Strindberg, you know, they seemed like nice people. <laughs> you know, I didn't hate him. They weren't my mortal enemies, right? So I thought to myself, well, who, who is? Who's somebody that I sincerely don't like very much? And I'd say, oh, I can beat you, Strindberg, that kind of thing. And I, and I found a, a picture of this person, and I uh, put it on my wall for a while. Put it on my office wall, had it framed put it up there. It wasn't six feet tall. It wasn't life size, but it was there. But I realized that uh, as people came into my office that they, some of them might know this person. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't want to have to explain my, my reason for having his picture on my wall. So I, I took that down. Uh, but truly if nobody's coming into your office, put anything up you want on the wall. It's up to you. It's your office. But find what motivates you. Find what motivates you and use the language and the intensity of how you say it and the physiology in your body of how you say it to make it happen now. Thanks for listening. This has been the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure seeing you again. Hope to see you again real soon. Come back next week when we have another gripping and exciting episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. And if you want to, you can find out more about us, each and every one of us, at EssentialCoachingSkills.com. Thanks. Thanks.